Live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to MHTV. It's lovely to have you with us tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about graphic medicine. We've got a fantastic panel for you. But before we get started, because we really want to hear from you, um, I'll hand over to Dave and Dave can tell you how you can join in. So, Dave. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great that you're joining us tonight. Uh, as always, there's a few ways that you can join in uh, the conversation. The first one is whilst you're watching on Facebook Live, just head to the right side of the screen. There should be a box where you can type in any comments or questions, thoughts, feelings, anything you want. Uh, obviously, we'll bring anything appropriate into the conversation. Uh, the other option that you've got is if you head over to Twitter, and all you have to do there is to use the hashtag MHTV. Uh, we'll be searching for that throughout the episode, and anything that we can bring into the conversation, we'll bring into that conversation. But as always, Nikki, straight back over to you. Yeah, let's introduce the guests. So first up, Emma, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, my name's Emma Berry. I'm a lecturer in health psychology at Queen's. Um, so a lot of my, my research has been rooted in exploring experiences of emotional distress and chronic conditions, um, specifically diabetes. So that's something I'd like to get into a little bit more in the, in the context of graphic novels. Um, but really, yeah, at the crux of my research is trying to understand um, what challenges people experience when they live with chronic health conditions and how best we can support them. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of my work in a nutshell. Fantastic. Rebecca? Hi, um, I'm Rebecca. So I'm a trainee clinical psychologist at Queen's University of Belfast. Um, and kind of why I'm involved in the conversation is I'm um, t doing quality of research um, to find out about the subjective experience of reading um, a comic. Um, and so hopefully I'll be chatting about that later on. Um, but yeah, also just have an interest in kind of like uh, comics and graphic novels in general and kind of like how they can kind of explain the subjective experience of something. So, so yeah. That's me. Lovely. And last but obviously not least, Jim. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Jim Lavery and I'm a graphic designer and illustrator. And one of the things I illustrate um, is comic books. And more and more recently, I've been involved in um, uh, different kinds of comic books rather than superheroes. Things more social and uh, medical and health related comics, which led me in contact with Dr. Emma. Um, and Rebecca as well. So we've kind of cross-pollinated um, through medicine and comic books. Brilliant. So let, let's come to Emma first, just to get the ball rolling. So when we're talking about graphic medicine, what are we, what are we talking about? So graphic medicine, I suppose, is a, a broad concept and probably as with any concept has different kind of ways of, of, of conceptualizing it. But to me, and based on what I've read, it's really a, a form of health communication that um, I guess places patients' experiences and also healthcare provider experiences, caregiver experiences through the, the novel medium of comics. So, you know, we, we think about comics typically in, in terms of superheroes and kind of Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, but this really places it in a, in a kind of real life context um, and particularly uh, to, to capture common health struggles, but also um, common health treatments. So, you know, I've come across graphic novels and comics that try to capture lived experience of cancer, of diabetes and what that's like in the emotional, social, behavioral struggles. But I've also seen it in the context of um, trying to educate patients and caregivers about complicated health treatments like getting an MRI. So, you know, I, I've seen it, I know um, Re Rebecca, you'll probably have, uh, this will ring a bell, but I know that there's been comics that have been um, trying to portray uh, what it's like to go through an MRI from the perspective of a young child. So if a child is, you know, has been told, well, you're going to get an MRI, what does that look like and, and what does that feel like? And a, a comic tries to capture some of those kind of nuances um, that are involved and and really is a conversation starter to help kind of break down that process. So, um, yeah, I guess it's a resource for healthcare providers, for patients, for caregivers. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, from my perspective, comics obviously are um, more accessible and um, something that's um, uh, more of a helpful resource from, for, uh, for some people more than other people. And it's not to say that it's a one size fits all, but yeah, it's, it's just a, a different way of, of, of communicating about health. Do you want to build on that at all, Rebecca? Yeah, I suppose like Emma kind of uh, already kind of mentioned it, but I suppose there's kind of like the two sides of graphic medicine. Well, the I how the how I understand it anyway is there's the kind of educational side of it, 
And then there's a kind of way of sharing your personal experience of going through something. And, and those two things can be overlapping. Um, so like, for example, uh, I've seen examples of graphic novels that t- like where people have shared their experience of going through an eating disorder or going through their experience of bipolar. And I suppose it's it's therapeutic in a way for the person writing or, or drawing the, the graphic novel, but it's also can also has potential to be therapeutic and educational for whoever's reading it. Um, so, so, so yeah, like I think it kind of like has a wide range of uses. And I think the combination of the art and then the kind of text really kind of lends itself to kind of being able to pull the reader into understanding someone's experience that you kind of don't really have in the same way with just the written word or just a picture. So mm-hmm. that's kind of how I see graphic medicine personally. Yeah. I really like the idea that in some ways it gives people a voice to talk about something that's particularly a really interior experience. Isn't it? So how you work with pain or how you feel about your mental well-being or something like that can feel something that's just happening to you. And if you don't have the words, it must be really hard to to get that information across to other people. But I like the idea as well of it being a resource for information giving. So perhaps we can come to our to our resident artists to find out how, how does this happen then? How does this process work? So um, how I came to it was um, usually through, I did for years and still do um, a lot of graphic design and it's very, very corporate it's quite boring from pie charts and scales those kind of things and sometimes you might have to do an advert and capture an idea really quickly in a poster so you've got a single image on a poster for the side of a bus and you've got to summarize a really complicated message really quickly on a simple message so that's that's where I come from. But I've done a little bit of art therapy and um, university and um, thought about, but I always knew that um, comic books were uh, and drawing were uh, just a really terrific communication tool. And if you could simplify it, really simplify it. So one of the things I do and did just recently was speak at schools and do little demonstrations of uh, for World, World Book Day with children. And I became convinced, my wife's a clinical psychologist and I became convinced that there was there's there's a different um method or, or commu- this case just be a communication tool if people because there's something about kids some idea gets into their head where they give up drawing or they say um I can't draw this idea I can't draw and it's it really frustrating and because w- one of the things um I, I really feel strongly about is that you could if you could represent an idea in your head graphically and then between the two of us we can agree that representation represents for both of us the same thing then we can agree we have it so one of the things that very very early days I started thinking about was having a pictorial pain chart that GPs could use so they could say this is the level of intensity of pain represented graphically and this is wear on the body so we could use some sort of graphic arts. That's the that was the genesis of it. But as I say, my 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 wife is um, a clinical psychologist, and she got me involved with a group of mental health service users at the hospital where she works, which became Mindlock, the um, comic book that Rebecca is researching. So I became I have no therapeutic training or insight at all. So it's not from that. But I just just became convinced that we could come up with a story and it, it's really the same techniques used in advertising mm. you might come along and say you know i've got a fabulous um car or something and i've got to sell that to uh, an audience and, uh, and find the market for that and i became with emma contacted me and we started working together the issues that we um worked on were very uh, really varied Uh, mental health and diabetes and plastic waste, really different issues, but the approach is the same whereby you you build up a narrative. What's the idea? What, how do you, what's the story? And there's some sort of story comes across and then you represent that pictorially. The thing about comic books and the things that comic book does better than almost any other media, in my opinion, is you can control time You've got to slow the reader down and control the pace at which they absorb information. And then they can reread it 
if they don't get it the first time and reread it again and again and again until you know the message is, is absorbed. And it can do that really simply, really simplistically. It can be stick figures, you know, if you mm-hmm. if that's all that you're capable of drawing stick figures, that's good enough. That is, and I really emphasize that when we're doing talks, that um if you've got a pen and a piece of paper and you can do stick figures, that you you're off to the races. It's as simple as that. And so with Emma, Emma, you maybe can correct me here. We started up doing, um, did we, I can't remember what started first. Did we have the workshops first or did the idea come first? I can't really remember. So um, I think the broad, this was, uh, was this for the, the plastic nightmare or no? The, the I think is that where we st- is, or are you? Oh, sorry for the plastic nightmare because that's where you and I first worked on is not right. Yeah. Right, and that's so. That's about plastic waste. That's a really, uh, not really health related, but that's it. But what I'm saying is that the approach is the same. But I can't remember which was first, the workshops or the the story. I can't remember. Yeah. So so um, just put, yeah, put it in context. This was a how how Jim the first project Jim and I worked on uh, was a, a plastic nightmare, um, which we're, we're we we uh, did an NI science festival uh, launch uh, a short while ago about. But, but really we had this idea that we wanted to capture the common challenges that people experience when faced with recycling on a day-to-day experience. Mm-hmm. So we had this broad idea, this is what we wanted to do. So we got um, a lot of kind of diverse people together in workshops and um, gathered their experiences of, of common challenges. And, and that started to filter into the, the narrative. So it was coming from lived experiences. So yeah, it was kind of, uh, I suppose it's a bottom-up approach in that sense when we think about what should, what should it go into the content of, of one of these novels. And it's the same with the, um, you know, the diabetes comic. Um, you know, which I can talk about more. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure it was the same with Mindlock. Um, the development of Mindlock mm-hmm. was really a bottom-up service, service user-led um, comic. So it was it was really guided by the, the lived experience of, of individuals with mental health um, challenges. So how do you take people talking about their experience and then transmit that into a, a piece of artwork that gives information? How do you, how do, what's the process there? That was re- we had to be really delicate. That was that's a really interesting question because w- what happened was in Mindlock, um, mm. we had I think uh, maybe eight mental health service users, and so they came along with their their stories and their backgrounds, and they were really uh, difficult, um, different things that they emphasised different things they wanted to communicate and, and different concerns that they have. So for me, that was really difficult because, again, I don't, I don't have any um, therapy um, knowledge or input or, and from that sense. So what I had tried to say is come up with a, what's the common goal what we, or what was the common thread, try and find a common issue. So with the mental health issues, a lot of the service users described some sort of journey. They said that they felt as though they were one time in a dark place and then describe going to the light or or somewhere difficult, but then overcoming. There was this description that they came, kept coming back or common to them all where uh, they had moved. They had found themselves in a really bad place and there were common thoughts of self-harm and uh, worthlessness and really, really difficult things. And that somehow, or what they wanted to communicate was, was there was a way out? There was something beyond it. They didn't to, to, to dwell in this place where they found themselves. That they wanted to say, even though we, we continue continue to struggle with our mental health, we want to say that there's a way beyond. That there's a way beyond this thing. So that w- I just saw that common thread on each of the stories. There were very different stories, and then very very traumatic and different um, backgrounds. But there was a common thread of this darkness they talked again about being down or being in darkness but then uh, transversing or or, or going beyond that so you you just you see that yeah 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 very strong images especially and we we talk we talk about that a lot about how a lot of um common threads were also self-harm and um uh, suicide thoughts and uh, attempts at suicide and you don't want to be giving anybody any t- 
chips, you know, there's certain imagery, knives and pills and, you know, these kind of things. Mm. Okay, we want to represent them, but we're not, this isn't, um, it's not a guide, you know, we have to be very careful about how you represent that. Mm. So it became really fascinating for me, uh, and I was asking, suppose from a, a psychology or psychologist's point of view, very naive and maybe inappropriate questions at times, you know, but I was guided there by um, the psychologists who were running, the th- you know, things that I should avoid or um, or where's best to steer. So I was very lucky that way. Um, but we had to find the, like the beats of a story. You know how in a joke there's the Irishman, the Scotsman, and you know the Englishman. Things that people recognize. there's a pattern. A journey. Uh, exa- mm. And then there's the punchline at the end. Mm. So. What I did was I saw that, um, I I kind of identified where I thought it would go. And then I assembled it into a story and then I pitched it. I said, okay, and we set run as a group and then I pitched it. And then I just let them tear it apart. They tore it down and they, you know, we don't like this. And and I think um, they felt in doing that, and I wasn't precious about it at all. I'd be happy if somebody else wrote it, no problem. Um, And some did, some had aspirations. They took ownership of it. They took a sort of, what can you say, um, a control, uh, ownership, um, invested, they invested in it. And so then they became territorial about it as well. They, they wanted to see, you know, they're very exact and, and very, and you just step back and say, this is terrific. Okay, let's let's go with this and, mm-hmm. and see if you come back. So it was a really interesting process for me uh, uh, and hopefully rewarding but we'll see what Rebecca comes up with the, <laughs> with the research I've see, heard, see how it comes or what, what messages come back from there yeah so Rebecca just when we get to get to talking about the kind of um you know your research and things I've had the first question in by um by DM here to me saying um how do we quality assure this so I guess it'll be very interesting to sort of think about that in a, in a moment but I just wanted to just cycle back maybe talk to Emma as well about so We've talked about kind of the the way the process works. Does the process work the same regardless of whether you're looking at cancer or diabetes or mental health or plastic? Is it the same sort of process under each time? So, um, I, and I guess this kind of um, is building on, on on Jim's description of the process, and and I think it might differ depending on the the group of individuals who are, you know, who are, ta- who are tasked with informing the comic, but also perhaps the comic artist. Um, I know the way that Jim and I work is very much in that process, that bottom-up approach. We get, we, we have a vague idea of what we want to produce, but that's it. You know, it's just the bare bones and, yeah. you know, we kind of want to get um, uh, uh, the, the grip of whoever, you know, whatever kind of uh, patient background or, or clientele uh, is the comic is is um is about we we want them to tell us kind of what the the comic looks like um and i suppose it depends age groups as well you know it, it might differ as well as um chronic conditions and and also i suppose it is what what people hope to gain from the comic process you know is it that they want to tell their stories is it that they want to provide more of a toolkit for 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 people and um, so I think it will really differ and that's the beauty of it and that's why when I come from a very researcher point of view and, and this probably relates to the quality control because this is where artists and researchers in a room can be very difficult <laughs> um, it's kind of like we want to measure everything really rigorously mm. but whenever you're measuring art and that process it's a process and it's subjective and it's messy so we need to allow for flexibility and that's why I think whenever it comes to the early stages of evaluating comics and the process qualitative methodologies are yeah. and ethnographic methodologies are right. are the better approach. I mean, you put in our, you know, you, you start to talk about randomized control trials and it's just, <laughs> you know, it's a whole different thing. So, so yeah, I think that's the beauty of it, that it's flexible, but that's also the kind of beast of it in that it's hard to measure. And that's that's where we're at at the minute. How do we measure these, um, the, the value of these types of interventions, I guess, in a sense, mm-hmm. um, in a way that is quality assured, but also allows for the flexibility. And that's, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what makes it successful then? This is a question for anybody. What makes a, um, a, a piece of graphic medicine successful? How do you, and what are the pitfalls? 
Um, I suppose like I, I'm happy to come in here. I suppose one of the things I found in my research, so uh, just as a wee bit of background, so I've used what's called like a think aloud procedure. So basically the study involved, um, it was over Zoom due to COVID and things, but basically the, the person read the comic in real time and reacted out loud as they were reading it. So it kind of gave a really kind of in the moment kind of response to different things, which I which generated some really interesting data. Um, but I think... Um, I forgot the question, sorry. Um, um, what, what makes one successful? What makes a yes. perfect medicine successful? What are the pitfalls? Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. And I think the thing that kind of took me back the most is, is the word that came up like without fail in all of the 23 interviews was relatable. So as, as Jim was saying, it's quite difficult to kind of capture everyone's experience, like even with the eight people that he was working with, it's it's near impossible to capture everyone's experience. But even in this comic, which is kind of just about one person's experience, you know, everybody that read it was able to kind of relate to it in a different way. And maybe not the entire thing, but like, and I think what I, what people, I noticed people reacting to was kind of like the metaphors in it. So like, for example, there's an image of the, of the character Sam lying with like bags over him that say despair on them. And quite a lot of people was like, yeah, that's exactly what it feels like. And I like think. Like sandbags, you mean? Yeah. Uh, um, I have, I have it here. I don't know how clear it's going to come up. Um, oh, yeah, these yeah. image here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I think people just really could relate to like how like depression, anxiety were portrayed graphically more so than if you'd give somebody a pamphlet and just have the symptoms. I think people, you know, wouldn't have been able to like relate that to their own experience as well. Um, so so, yeah, I think it's the relatability that I find that I find really interesting about kind of the, the research. Hmm. So a successful novel is one that people can relate to, basically, then it doesn't matter what it's doing, a successful piece of graphic medicine. Yeah, and then I suppose a second aspect, aspect as well is I, I, I kind of the empathy component of it. I think for something to be successful, people mm -hmm. need to feel something by it. Like if you're if you're reading a comic, but like you don't really care about the character or, you know, mm -hmm. you can't relate. It seems like preposterous. Like you're not going to, to want to read. You're not going to care about what happens to the character. So I think, you know, the empathy as well. And I think... Um, some of the images that Jim did, you know, with kind of like the close-up images, a lot of people would pick up on those saying like, oh, I can see the emotions in, in this character's face. Mm -hmm. um, and things like that were really effective for pulling people in and making them kind of invest in the comic, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You can see as well, they would have like um, sort of more than one use as well, something for individuals to consume, but also something for groups to discuss and actually to, to start being able to use that as a jumping off point for connecting other experiences. It's exciting, yeah. Um, Emma, is there anything you wanted to add to things um, such as uh, successes and what makes pitfalls for for comics? Yeah, I suppose. Um, I mean, my my first thing uh, thought is kind of it depends how we measure success and what we're kind of interested in. Because as Rebecca mentioned, there are two kind of ways that um, develop that, that comics can be helpful. First is the development of the comic. It's cathartic, it's therapeutic. I mean, that in itself is getting something down on a page and it's getting it out. Um, and it's it's kind of, um, I guess it's kind of immortalizing a really difficult experience, um, you know, and, and that in itself is, is kind of um, validating. Um, but then you've got the other side, it's the evaluation of an existing comic for other people, you know, who are struggling as well. Um, you know, Rebecca's coming at that from a qualitative perspective, you know, asking, well, what is it about this comic that stands out to you? Um, what's helpful, what's not helpful? And of course, we can look at ways to quant quantitatively measure that, you know, through kind of designs that allow us to evaluate through surveys, through, you know, measures of distress, um, depending on, on depending on, on what the comic's about and what we, we feel that it might um, elicit change in. Um, I suppose pitfalls, and this is something that's, you know, come up and I'm sure, you know, Jim, you know, you've encountered as well, is that, you know, the medium of comics is... Um, I think there might be somewhat of a stigma against comics in that people, you know, I know it's, it's a question that Jim and I actually were asked by um, someone in an audience when we launched the Plastic Nightmare was, do you not think comics are a bit simplistic? You know, what about an adult audience? And and, and I, so I, I suppose there's a sense of, um, there might be a kind of a sense that you might get a biased audience 
who are into comics. Now, I'm I'm saying this from the perspective of the, these are kind of questions that have been uh, pitched at us. Um, so while we're saying that this is an accessible and novel form of health communication, um, you know, there is the the sense that it's 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 perhaps not the medium that that's accessible for for all people and mm. um, so that I suppose that's one pitfall in that just uh stigma 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 um against comics and yes. um, but the other I suppose the other pitfall is 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 around the kind of measure of success how, how do we measure it how do we how do we um kind of capture the the nuances of a comic um in a way that justifies the potential benefits um, and how do we evaluate effectiveness so that more people can be exposed to the benefits of comics? Um, so, yeah, to the pitfall, I suppose one's, a, one's about the, the definition of a comic and one's about the measurement of a comic. So they would be the two things that come to mind. Do you think it's that people think that comics are for children or for entertainment and so they're not appropriate for serious health messages? Is that or trivialising people's difficulties? Okay. Okay. But it's interesting isn't it? because some of the people who would be most helped by that are the people who would want to read comics. And also, I think because people since the 90s, I think comics for adults and, and kind of graphic novels and that kind of stuff has become a lot more accessible. Yeah, it's interesting. So let me come to these two questions. I've come through. So one is um, Dari talking about um, how do you quality assure, assure this? It was a very serious question. Well done. <laughs> I like that. And the other one is is um, Eri and asking for um, recommendations. I said, I love this idea. What should I read? So I just started off the impromptu reading list from you there, guys. So um, let's talk about quality assurance just to give you a chance to get your recommendations um, ready. Well, Eri, um, in terms of the artwork, I suppose, is there's... Um, yeah, that's a difficult one because um, I see there's there's as Emma kind of alluded to a second ago. There's um, there are times where the I don't want to say patients, what don't, the participants want are, are eager and want to draw themselves, and you know that's I'm just strictly talking about the artwork here and the and the story, so. Um, and they want to do that and it, that is a therapeutic in itself and that's part of that and then, they, and then they get ownership of it and in which case maybe there's an artist to facilitate and then whatever produced um, is just theirs and if the effectiveness of it maybe isn't in the quality of the illustrations but in doing it. Yeah. So there, there's there's a benefit to that. Um, when I was doing, uh, we, the in Mindlock, we with all our sessions, I asked everybody in no matter what capacity to um, illustrate things. We, they all had drawing pads with them and we all drew together. In fact, I didn't do very much. I let them do it. I thought well, there'd be a sort of hierarchy or anything. And to draw anything almost like a brainstorm mm. and then the artwork, there's a to inking and colouring and I get input in that sense as well but one of the things um, maybe that speaks to that point um, directly is I always ask them to a man um, a waiting room they all start off I think their journey in the healthcare system at a waiting room at a doctor's GP or at a uh, um, an appointment somewhere in some sort of hospital, maybe some, you know, and they're in a waiting room and they and they want something to read or there's something there in front of them. And I want I'll always ask them. Um, I think Emma, we did this as well to imagine the client is you if you're on your first appointment. Mm. What would be effective for you? What how would the, how would you communicate? What would you say to yourself? What what would be the, what is the most important message that you would want? told to you to put you at your ease to take you through this journey you're about to go through i'm thinking about there's even just practical information about so if, if it's uh, on the subject of diabetes you know you hear a lot of things insulin and injections and scans and blood and you hear all of things they're quite frightening what does that mean were you at ease about that what will put you at? so i always ask those questions and ask the participants to imagine either themselves what, what 
would they have liked to have read or imagine the, the person coming behind them? And so you can measure it from that if you've if effectively communicated really sometimes practical information. Um, what's going to happen to me? What does that mean? What is insulin? What does Which part of the body does it affect? Why is this happening? And so those boxes and say, yes, we've, we've addressed this and this and this and this, and these are really important. And then you, you might have input from medical um, staff who say, you've you've got to be accurate. This is a really important piece of information about how drugs work on the blood and so on and so on. And you, you've got to address that. That's a really important. So from that perspective, um, as for the quality of the artwork, well, I don't know. It's just, it depends on your budget, I suppose. I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> we'll just leave that there. <laughs> so perhaps, because that's been really interesting, what you've kind of given us there is kind of like a, a kind of really personal perspective, isn't it, on whether it works for the individual, how you do that. So, Rebecca, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing kind of in more of a systematic way than talking from a, from a, a research way? How does that differ? Um, so in terms of... Um, quality assurance. So my um, research is using a qualitative um, approach. So I'm using a subjective thematic analysis. So I, I suppose the way that that kind of approach gets gets around the quality assurance is it kind of owns its objectivity. So it's not claiming to be objective or to find in the one true story. It's about the researcher from their perspective kind of thinking, well, what what am I seeing in this data? What do I think is really interesting and needs to be talked about? Um, I suppose I came into the project, you know, after kind of like the co-design part of it. So I, um, so the kind of comic, that, that, that kind of side of things had already been kind of completed. So, so my side of it was more just kind of exploring how different people like responded to it. And I suppose I tried to make sure I had kind of like a, a broad sample. So I used a student sample, but I, I recruited from across all the different schools because, and I'm so glad I did because for example, like English students will like pick up on the symbolism and things and, and notice things where psychology students might notice more the kind of mental health specific. So yeah. it kind of was my way of trying to think, well, people are coming at it from different hats. So like that's one way to kind of ensure we're kind of getting a, a view of what everybody might think. Um, but I suppose in terms of like the more quantitative side of things, I suppose I, I haven't tried to do that. And I think what Emma was trying to say as well is it kind of makes sense to do the more qualitative piece first because you're trying to kind of get down to what's important. And then from that, then you could kind of explore it in a more quantitative way if, if you felt it was important to do so. Hmm. Hmm. Emma, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, the, I suppose, yeah, the, the only thing I would add again is, is I, I guess it depends what um, what way you're approaching quality assurance. I mean, mm. Jim's talked about the development of the comic quality assurance, yeah. um, which, you know, if you're if you're going for a bottom up approach, you know, yeah. you're acknowledging that that this is a snapshot of of a, of a variation of lived experiences and it may not be applicable to all people. But, um, you know, I suppose if you've a varied enough group that are contributing mm -hmm. now there's going to be socioeconomic differences cultural differences and I think that's the importance of um you know if you're developed like the likes of Mindlock you know it was um developed it was co-designed by a group of individuals who are living in Northern Ireland and um, it would be really useful to see that in a different country in a different culture um, and I think in terms of quality assurance in terms of the I guess the um, ecological validity, if you like, sort of, you know, how representative is this to, um, to to real life? It would be really good to kind of develop comics across, you know, across different um, social settings. But what Rebecca's coming down to is quality assurance and the measurement and the evaluation of it. And yeah, I think that's that that is the challenge. But I think qualitative um, research, yeah, as Rebecca says, allows us to to kind of get a sense of the big kind of themes that are coming out in terms of, you know, what what potentially could change in mm. people after reading the comic. And that's when we, that, that could inform the selection of outcome measures if we were to quantitative, quantitatively mm. evaluate it. Mm. Um, so yeah, quality assurance is a big question, but a very big question. <laughs> thank, that, thank you for that second year student, not a bad question, not a bad yeah. question. And before we go on to recommendations, I think Dave's got something that he would like to ask as well. Yeah, I've had a few questions then. Uh, one of them, uh, I, I thought it was a really interesting one. Uh, one of the criticisms of images of people with a mental illness is the head clutcher photo. 
Uh, do you have the same kind of issues and concerns raised with a graphic novel? Or is it different because of the way that comics are not a point in time, but have more of a story arc? I could maybe um, just talk about a high... Um you, you've got to be really sensitive to those issues uh, on all sorts of levels, uh, even um, gender and ethnicity and all sorts of representation. There's a fine line. You've got to really be careful about how you represent and stigma and all of those things. It's it's a really difficult thing to do. Um, yeah, it's tough, but you, you just if you treat it with sensitivity and um, especially if there's... So I did a... Um, illustrations for um, a scoliosis um, project and it's an issue I hadn't known about before and so I was really really careful about how I represent that you just have to show some sensitivity and be careful in your illustration when you're representing those kind of things there's a really fine line between sort of grotesque caricature and sympathetic um, representation. It's a fine line. It's a real difficult. You've just got to be really, really careful. I suppose, Jim, just, just to kind of further elaborate on that, is one of the problems that are that some graphic novel novels will kind of want to kind of, you know, be really graphical about things. I'm just thinking, you know, I'm not a huge expert, but thinking about some of the kind of, uh, you know, the stuff around the kind of Kill Bill sort of mm. way, the way they use comics, which are hugely graphical. It, mm. Kind of is that pushing the negative way against how comics are used? Well, there's there's a whole range, of, and it's really peculiar because you have this attitude, this bias against comics that it's a child's medium, and so on and so on. But at the same time, in the cinema, these comic book movies are grossing billions and billions and billions of pounds and dollars all over the place. One of the most uh, um, uh, financially successful and well known are the X Men series of movies well within the x-men there are people who are disabled with it and have disabilities are blind they are in wheelchairs they have physical deformities they have all these sorts of things what if um, um issues uh, all within this franchise this is enormously popular franchise but i think that there's there's a couple of um uh there's a couple of um approaches to it. one is the just exploitative so you see that in horror or genre comics like uh, zombies and that kind of thing where there's a uh, grotesque body horror and that kind of thing and on the other hand of it um it'd be unlikely that anybody could illustrate a comic book a mainstream comic book where they're exploiting some sort of disability or, or, or physical deformity. It's just unacceptable to do that. Wait, you know, it unless it's in a real to, genre. It takes your background to scarring again, though, doesn't it? Facial scarring. I mean, every yeah. time Bond does this, doesn't it, in the Bond films, they they, they're all, yeah. a baddie because they put something on them that marks them that shows you that they're not a good yeah. person. And that's so... Yeah. It's And every year people go, why do you keep doing that? And they still keep doing it. So I think some of it just... It's so ubiquitous, it's unseen almost. Mm. Yeah. And you think it, 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 these characters... Oh, sorry. I'm gone. I was just thinking, I was trying to think of some characters. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, it is physical deformity is usually characteristic of evil. And, you know, and uh, thinking of Batman's, um, one of Batman. And villains, Two Face, who has yeah. one of his face deformed, scarred, and that is he's you know he's a bad character. He's an evil. It's quite often that physical, particularly on the face, yeah. uh, physical deformity are, are represents an evil character. But I think that's true. I, mean, I think that's true. If you think about Richard the Third, Second, with the hump on his back, you know this physical <laughs> deformity yeah. representing. I think it's part of. Or Captain Hook with his claw, he's got a, you know, or his, his, his hook, you know, that kind of, it's a it's an outward representation of the character's inward mm. personality, really. It's just a manifestation. Mm. Whereas if in the X-Men, um, Professor X is in a wheelchair, but um, he looks like, Pat he is Patrick Stewart. 
mm. you know, one of the most famous actors in the world. Um, it's not an issue. He's he's got a disability. Mm. I, I'm trying to think. Um, Scott Summers is blind. I think he is blind. Uh, Matt Murdock, he's blind. Mm. So they, they they have physical. But I think in that way, I think that we have a long tradition of uh, outward deformities or disabilities. So you've got to be careful. You've just got to be careful on, on how you do that. You know, with health related. I, I think since it's a. I think it's interesting as you've been talking, you've kind of gone over to one of the other questions that's come in uh, and kind of this thing about, you know, how much comics have been a, 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 a good avenue to kind of increase the diversity in, in you know, like in the media. Uh, and just yeah. thinking about how some of the less represented in kind of mainstream movies are now becoming representative or represented yeah. because comics... The, the, the kind of transitioning from comics. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of Miss Marvel. As you know, Disney Plus are going to have a series out in the next few weeks, which you know, a, a Muslim superhero. And and yeah. and so, I, I suppose it's that question about are comics a great vehicle to kind of bring out representation and to to give a voice to people that have historically had, you know, a difficulty in accessing that voice. Am I happy to come yeah. in on this one? Um, yeah. I suppose, like from from a graphic novel point of view, some of the ones that I've I've read would the work of Meg John Barker. She um, has um, so she uh, sorry they um, um, have done a lot of work um, with graphic with the graphic novel form and all sorts of topics from like sexuality and gender and really kind of trying to educate people and 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 as you're kind of saying, day of kind of people that maybe didn't normally have a voice, you know, so their work is really great. And I, one of the, one of the pieces of work that I would recommend in terms of that. And, and I think, um, I suppose in my eyes, there's a wee bit of a difference from kind of like, you know, comics as in the superhero comics and then the kind of more graphic medicine, I think, because a lot of the graphic medicine work tends to be from like a person's lived experience. They, they generally are really respectful and really mindful about things like that. And it tends to be from people that maybe have been underrepresented, like kind of people who have experienced mental health difficulties or, or different sort of um, things that kind of maybe haven't had a voice before. So... So, yeah. No, I, I think that's such an important point. And yeah, you certainly kind of, you know, did, I had a little bit of a light bulb moment when you, you mentioned something then. So, no, that was, that was brilliant. Uh, Nikki, have you got any more sort of questions that you've seen? Or? Big questions, but we still didn't answer. Um, a second question was was any recommendations? So, Meg John Barker's oh, recommendation from yes. America. Well done. Uh, <laughs> I have a, a recommendation. I have the book right here. I don't want to go off screen to show it, but uh, to lift it up. But is that okay if I? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So second. Oh dear, dear, dear. <laughs> My recommendation. Oh, grab it out of my thing. Is this? Oh, it's a book called "The Contract with God." Whoa. Yeah. And what do okay. you like about it? Oh my goodness. Well. Uh, well <laughs> In, in a few words. <laughs> in a few words. It's, it's pure emotion. It's written by a man, a genius man called Will Eisner. He grew up in Depression era New York mm -hmm. and uh, he illustrated basically Depression era New York. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful, wonderful book in terms of illustration and just the, and his ability, you know, his ability is second to none as, as an illustrator, but the emotion, the way he emotes through simple line drawings uh, are second to none. And also it can just give you an idea how simple, how simplistic um, um, and impactful uh, some ink on a page can be. Yeah. Contract with God. All right. Um, you heard it here first, people. So Emma. Um, for me, I, I think I would probably happily pass to Rebecca. Um, and and I, I feel like you, you've got a plethora of, uh, of recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as I said, uh, Meg John Barker would definitely um, have lots of, of good graphic novels. Um, one I read recently was Coma by Zara Slattery. Hopefully I'm saying her name right. It's kind of about her experience of, of being in a coma. It's really interesting from both her perspective um, and then also her husband's perspective while she's in the coma. Um, but, but yeah, there's so many, I just couldn't name them all, but I'm happy to send through some recommendations. Absolutely. Just tweet them out. Tweet them out with the hashtag, and I think um, I'm putting Meg John Barker up now. 
Okay. Oh, actually, okay. they say that um, it would be really good. This is a soapbox. Feel free to disagree with me. Um, but uh, Mouse by Art Spiegelman has been taken off the recommended reading um, uh, in Texas, I think, because they yeah. have uh, some... It's too influential. Annoyed. It's for it's just it's an unbelievable book. It's a wonderful book, and um, but for some reason, some people have taken against it and removed it from the reading. The last thing you'd want is people questioning totalitarianism <laughs> in Texas. <laughs> Texas, I never heard anything so outrageous. So yeah, any any uh, any chance? To, yeah, to absolutely. Well, and that, that will be in that will be in libraries everywhere. You'll be able to get out of that, and yeah. even if you can't get it, if you Google it, you'll be able to see a lot of the images, and they might they might really speak to you so it's a useful thing i think to to to, to get engaged with we're gonna have to sort of finish up now because we've whizzed oh. across i did tell you it was four to five minutes we'd go fast and it has done oh, as ever so what we're going to do is we're going to come to each of you if there's anything that you haven't had a chance to say yet or if there's anything you wanted to bring up um or leave people with as, a, as an idea or an image or a recommendation please do that so come to Re rebecca first um, yeah, I just had a great time. Um, and yeah, I, I'm trying to think of if there's any kind of ones I'd really recommend as well. Um, yeah, um, Becoming on Becoming by Una is, is really fantastic. It's quite a sensitive subject, um, but I would really recommend that graphic novel as well. William? Jim, anything from you? Jim, did, sorry, did you say me? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah, you're, you're, on a, you're on a podcast, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what day is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the only thing I would really encourage uh, everybody is keep drawing, draw all the time. I've done a really simple drawing today that said, this is fun. If you can do that, a rectangle and write, so it's the beginning. That's enough. And if you do that every day, something you're illustration will get better your um uh, connection to your emotions will get better it's really easy i would just always encourage people to draw as much as possible no matter how bad they think they are please draw it's really fun absolutely emma yeah and um, just it was a delight to be on the show and um also to have my my two um buddies jim and rebecca with me um <laughs> just to mention um you know i i uh, we have recently developed the the diabetes cyberspace comic we haven't launched mm -hmm. it yet but we will be launching it soon and I'll be sure to tag you guys and um, to retweet. Um, also, if you want, if anyone wants to get in contact with me about that, it'd be, it would be brilliant. It's really a, depicting the story of a young person um, who lives with type 1 diabetes and their experience of social media and the toxic nature of it, but also the helpful nature of it as well. And to be honest, a lot of the themes that come up are very hashtag relatable for, you know, all of us um, from social media trolls to, you know, people posting their best side all the time and then you know so uh yeah if there's any interest in that you know please get in contact with with Jim and I um yeah so lovely Dave is there anything you wanted to add before we wrap up yeah I just think it's been so nice to kind of think about a subject tonight that I've not thought about for quite a while uh and that kind of bit about as, as a kid I probably looked and read it a, a lot more comics than I kind of have done recently and it's been nice kind of sort of thinking back to that time but also kind of weaving it into the, the conversation that we've had tonight uh, and I kind of hope that I, I will kind of spend a little bit of time you know like just in the prep for the this episode I've kind of done a bit of a, a troll through Jim's uh, social media account uh, and obviously seeing yeah. you know some of the some of the images that he's drawn and it, it's, it's nice isn't it, just looking at things that are visually stimulating and interesting and different to what you normally look at. you know it's just nice to be kind of I say challenged not in a kind of a you know someone having a go at me but challenged as in just doing something differently so I, th I think it's been a lovely opportunity to, to do that tonight Nikki so uh yeah no just brilliant sort of you know information and it's it's been really really fascinating so it'd be great if the conversation can continue and you can send us any comics that come out in the future yeah, yeah. brilliant brilliant I think for me what I've really enjoyed is this idea about people owning their own stories and because comics are so related to superheroes, there's something about be becoming a superhero yourself. And there's something, you know, when people experience pain or difficulty and that journey changes you, that's that's the journey of a superhero, isn't it? Going yeah. from one place to another and, and developing different skills because of it. It's, it's I, I really like that idea about everybody having something heroic about them in their life. Yeah. 
you know, it makes yeah. her, her, heroism big and small at the same time. And I like that very much as an idea. So thank you very much, guys, for your, your time and, and sharing your skills and your talent with us. It's really exciting. Um, next week, we've got um, Value of CAMS Nursing. So if you're interested in the mental health and well-being of children and young people, which is so um, pressured and under threat at the moment, um, please do join us next week and we'll be really um, pleased to hear from you. Any questions you will have for our panel there, which is Grace Cook and Anne Cox. So thanks very much, guys, and good night all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.